Good evening. I'll try it again. Good evening. That's more like it. Thank you very much for coming tonight. I'm Matt O'Donnell. I'm the Dean of uh, Engineering at UW. The two speakers we will have, one is from Boeing and one is from UW. I'm going to get my notes just so I make sure I get the titles right uh, uh, for them. The first will be Al Miller, who's a distinguished alumnus uh, of the college, a double alumnus uh, of the college. Uh, he is the uh, Director of Technology Integration for the 787 Dreamline, uh, Dreamliner program. Uh, or as I like to affectionately call, he's the chief geek of the 787 project. So he will tell you uh, from the bottom up uh, about the 787. He'll then be followed, uh, and Al, you'll just introduce Mark, will then be followed by Mark Tuttle, who's the chair uh, of the mechanical engineering department uh, here at UW and a longtime faculty member who's an expert on composite materials, and he'll talk about what's next with uh, composites beyond uh, the 787. So it's my pleasure to bring to you and introduce to you Al Miller. Can I do? Okay. Good, Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I'm pleased to be here. And, and first of all, thank you for taking time out of your busy lives to come see me. Uh, but you're really not going to see me. You're going to see the work of thousands of people around the world uh, on this wonderful project we're working called the 787 Dreamliner. So let's get right to it. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is the market. Uh, why do we build this airplane? Why, why this one? Why not something else? Uh, a little bit about the technology overview, kind of a broad brush type of thing. But the, the in, and I'll cover a little aerodynamics, very little systems. Uh, mainly we'll be looking at the composites uh, type of area, the composite structures, composite materials, as Matt referenced. Uh, talk about our production pro uh, structural test overview, which will go through the um, uh, types of testing we do. It's not the whole thing, but it gives you a pretty good flavor for the kind of issues we're trying to address. Then I want to talk about the production progress, where we're at, uh, some wonderful pictures, and then uh, Mark's going to talk about this broader view type perspective. Now, what, starting with why we chose to build the airplane, and green is sort of this twin aisle market. This, this is where the uh, 787, uh, 777, A330, A340, uh, 767 market sits. That's a twin aisle, a couple hundred passenger type market. And, and over the next 20 years, it's about uh, a quarter of the 27,000 plus airplanes we expect to be built worldwide. It represents about 45% of the money. So first of all, it's a nice place to be in the marketplace, a lot of financial interest there. The other issue is the existing designs. Uh, uh, we're out there for quite a while. The 767 is getting, uh, I guess the expression might be sort of long in the tooth. Uh, it was uh, been a, a 19, late 1970s, early 1980 introduction into service. Uh, and and there, the, so the airplane design itself was, was uh, eligible for refurbishment, I guess you could say. Uh, also, it was coming up in a time in the marketplace where uh, the airline fleets were going to have to turn over anyway. So there's a natural cycle of fleet progression, uh, capital goods industry. We expected that to happen in about this time frame. Uh, lastly, uh, we were moving into an interesting place. We had gone out to the marketplace a little earlier with an airplane, some of you may recall, called the Sonic Cruiser, a uh, higher speed airplane. And we talked to the airlines about it. And they said speed or efficiency. And they came back and said efficiency, clearly. And so we headed out on that vector because that's really what our customer wanted in this particular segment of the industry. Uh, the 787 is not an airplane, it's a family of airplanes, and I think this is an important concept. We've identified three models, and the one we're going to talk about tonight is the Dash 8. That's the first airplane that comes off the uh, production line. It's a transoceanic airplane, this 210, 250 passenger type size airplane. There's a Dash 3, that's a short range version, really targeted right now for the Japan domestic market with our, uh, one of our customers on the pond. And the Dash 9 is a stretch. Again, a long range airplane, a little bit bigger. There's other models potentially out there, and certainly the press has talked about them at various times, but these are the three that we're really focused on that we've announced and which we have orders for and we're working through. 
Uh, what's in this 787? And they're talking about the eight first, and a lot of these are common. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things involved in the airplane changes. Just because I mentioned the design got to be refurbished, we got to that point. So things involving the flight deck we'll look at tonight briefly. Uh, there are things involving advanced engines and the cells. We'll talk about how that affects sound and some of the efficiency issues. Uh, we'll take a look at the passenger cabin very briefly. There's a lot of systems issues in the cabin. I, human systems is the way to articulate that. Um, the large cargo capacity and the composite primary structure kind of go together in, in the sense that we designed for cargo uh, uh, capability with certain kinds of containers, and the composite technology allowed us to do that. Composites allowed us to do a lot of other things as well, which is mainly what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, I will only briefly go over the systems, and in fact, if next year you need a lecture for this engineering series, we might think about the innovative systems on the airplane might be a good topic for that. Uh, so let's proceed. Um, this is where the air airplane flies. Uh, it's, uh, I put cane hall in the middle, and all we have to do is <laughs> pave this section down here towards Frosh Pond, and you, you know, it's going downhill with the headwind, you might be able to pull up in time. Uh, and if you had a Dash 3, you could get to Honolulu, and uh, otherwise you could get almost, well, you could get to Singapore. Uh, so you get an idea of the range of the 787 Dash 9. Um, I think so you can see that transoceanic, that long range, and the, the chart also illustrates for some graphical reason we have never figured out that Tom Friedman is right. The world is sort of flat over there in, in the far east near Singapore. Um, looking at the better flying experience, there's some things in this chart that we'll talk about related to composites, some of the width issues we'll talk about, like with the cargo, the bigger windows, and the lower cabin altitude. And I put little green stars because we'll, we'll come back to those vignettes later. But there's also a lot of things we did from a systems point of view, a human systems point of view in terms of the air quality, the humidity issue, the type of lighting we did, uh, the ride, which is actually associated with the systems, uh, uh, how we handled that with the systems. And I gotta tell you the truth, the wider seats and aisles, it's available. Whether your airline chooses to use that or not, is, uh, I can't control that. Oh, and I do like the large overhead bins, that those are very nice. <laughs> Um, we don't have shades in this airplane, so there's something to think about. You don't get to pull the shade down. You've got these dimmable windows, and this shows the window in different shades from clear to opaque. Uh, this is actually in the Bowmark site up in Everett, uh, and, and it gives you an idea of the shading. That'll be done electronically on the airplane, um, and so that's kind of a nice little feature. We got to a point where we could trade the weight versus cost of, of those issues. Uh, one thing this doesn't solve yet is when the person two rows in front of you elects not to shut their window or opaque it and you want to watch the movie, we haven't figured out how to give you control of their window electronically, so we have to work on that. Um, efficiency I talked about, this is, this is probably one of the really, really important parts of this airplane, and it's not due to one thing. We'll talk about the elements that go into this. Uh, we plotted four engine airplanes and two engine airplanes and where the 787 uh, sits. And so on the y-axis is fuel consumption per trip and on the x-axis is fuel consumption per, per seat. I'm sorry, on the y-axis and per trip on the x-axis. And, and the nomographs are, are different uh, passenger capacities. Uh, and, and the point here is, is that there's a step function. And, and Matt talked about a quantitative change making a qualitative difference in how you experience the environment. Uh, the airline folks who help work with us on these things are all about quantitative numbers and, and, and fuel burn and fuel costs are just essential in the economic uh, operating issues of an airline. And so this became that study we had earlier between high speed and efficiency, this is where they said they needed to be. So you can see the 787 becomes a, a, a powerful departure from the existing capability. And, and I think we'll see that in the, the fleet, uh, the order data, we look at why people are ordering it. Now there are several reasons we make fuel efficiency and certainly uh, uh, composite materials plays a role but also does aerodynamics we'll talk about in systems and flight control laws and so on. So it's not just one thing, it is an integrated view. Uh, another part of this airplane though is environmental and we have been um, getting into this area in a very serious way in this model. We talked about less fuel use, I just showed you a chart on that. That translates to lower emissions. There are some other things we do that you might not think about. We'll talk a little bit about the flight control characteristics, flight control laws. Uh, we particularly geared on takeoff to get the airplane up faster and then to be able to throttle the engine back so we can actually use less fuel in that part of the maneuver. That's another way to save fuel and, and to uh, reduce emissions. It's also a noise abatement type of strategy. And we'll talk a little bit, I think on the next chart, perhaps about the quieter communities and the kinds of things we're doing there. Hazardous materials and less waste is part of the manufacturing system and we're talking about how we do that with, with composite materials largely in this airport. Uh, this is uh, Dorita Airport. 
And an important part of this discussion, even though I'm choosing to show Narita, um, is that the airplane is geared for long haul. So one of the issues you get in these uh, airports you go into with, air, uh, with these kind of airplanes is noise abatement, noise control. Now the black is the runway. That is the runway uh, at Narita Airport. And uh, uh, the, uh, the colored lines show where an 85 dB, an 85 dB is kind of a loud noise. It's not necessarily ear splitting. It's just a loud noise and kind of arbitrary reference point. But you'll see that the green line, the A7878, is inside the runway type of situation for this particular uh, airport. And what that means is we're putting less noise into the community. What that also helps the community, but also helps the airline, because some airports have noise restrictions on when you can fly your airplanes. And so this means it's easier for the airline to dispatch the airplane when the routing says they could go, and the airplane has more utility to them. Now one way we get there is the inlets. Uh, of the upper right-hand corner, that's what's called an acoustically smooth inlet, and there's our little reverberation chambers in that inner black surface in front of the fan blade, the, those squiggly little things that go around. Um, and those, those areas there, acoustically smooth means we've taken out the dead zones, which actually is a place where the sound reverb uh, bounces back, if you will, out of the engine. Uh, and that's an advancement in the noise technology. Uh, down here is a, a picture of these uh, chevrons, they're called, they're the jagged edges, the edge of the cell around the engine. Uh, that's actually off a 777 airplane, the QTD-2, we, we flew and proved the technology out. Uh, we use that, interestingly, the 787 largely for cabin noise because what it does is it changes the aerodynamics so the engine uh, um, pressure wave coming off the back doesn't want to reattach to the side of the fuselage and that creates noise in the rear cabin. So by doing these, we can direct it further back. Slightly different aer aerodynamics, though, from one of our other models, a four-engine airplane you may have heard of, um, uses that same technology for community noise. So depending on the aerodynamics specific, we use the technology for different benefits. Just an example of how we do that. Uh, one of the issues uh, is cost. I mentioned with the fuel burn. Another one is maintenance uh, costs over the life of the airplane. And the green would be uh, what we expect uh, we're going to get out of the 787-8, and the blue would be a traditional 767-300, kind of a baseline airplane in that market. I mentioned an older design concept. And, and one of the things that comes out is because of the corrosion and fatigue resistance of the materials and the designs equations we used. So we've been able to make substantial improvements in particularly the later year total life cycle costs of the airplane by, getting, by improving the corrosion resistance and improving the fatigue resistance. Fatigue now, in this case I'm using in the concept of cyclic loading. And this, so it's kind of a technical term. I, it's not getting tired. Uh, that's a misuse of the word. In this case, it's cyclic loading and then the response of the material to that's called a fatigue uh, spectrum or fatigue, fatigue testing. And we'll see some of this later on some fuselage panels. We'll show that. So the, the benefit there is in the cost uh, of the, and that's really associated with the composite materials. Uh, in terms of where the overall benefit comes from, about 40% are from the engines. Now, one subtlety about the engines is how we do the systems in this airplane. All other commercial airplanes up to now have had what's called bleed air systems. And so what we do in the airplane is we'll take hot air off the engine exhaust system and drive it through a heat exchanger, generate electricity, and give you lights and a variety of features on the airplane. This is the first large commercial airplane that's actually put the generators on the engine and so rather than using bleed air off, we actually generate directly off the engine uh, turning process. Um, that technology has allowed us to go to a significantly more electric airplane, and, and there's a technical term we use for all the pneumatic ducts and stuff, and it's called claptrap. It's the stuff we put on airplanes today, and we just get rid of it, because you don't have to have it. Now, to be, to be fair here, we still use it for uh, de-icing of the nacelle leading edge. We still use bleed air up there. But the other places, we're moving away from that towards electrical power generation. And the point of that would be that the engine's been optimized for the 787 or this more electric airplane architecture, systems architecture. And when we uh, put these engines, you could put them on another airplane. Uh, you could use a bleed air airplane, but it wouldn't be as efficient. So the benefit you get is optimized for where the engine was really articulated. Uh, I'll talk about aerodynamics, and that's even a significant uh, advance, I think, in that in the last couple of years, and we'll spend most of the time in materials and structures. I'll talk only briefly about the systems, and the systems benefit have been things on flight control laws and how we uh, reduce weight by the, these electrical generation systems. Now, who's been doing this has been 
uh, I think we got most of them here. Uh, this is, in fact, a big program. And while this international team includes both the structures, systems, and propulsion and landing gear suppliers, uh, I think it's worth pointing out that behind each of these is their supply chain and who their suppliers are for equipment and tools and people and components and parts. Now, we actually sat down in my office a couple of times and tried to figure out how many people are working in this program, and we could not calculate it. Uh, it, it just, it just, you just can't get enough visibility of the entire uh, supply chain involved. Um, if you told me it was 50,000 people or, or 75,000 people, it'd be plausible, but we wouldn't know how to prove that. But we're pretty sure that right now, at this phase, we are the single largest industrial project in the world right now. We, we, we think there may be, obviously, government programs that are bigger, and there's also companies that have a lot more investment. But from a single project, we, we suspect the total investment is as large as it comes right now. In terms of the aerodynamics, uh, this is, uh, give a little update on this, and this is particularly interesting. I know the university is uh, out looking for some expertise in computational fluid dynamics, and this is one of the key areas. I'll come back to this picture of this chart. Um, what we're, we've been able to do is fly the airplane aerodynamically on the computer significantly more than in the past. Uh, in the middle there, we have this asymmetric, so we're, the flight control services are, are more up on one side than another. Uh, the lower left-hand side, the thrust reverser simulation, uh, what we're looking at in that particular case was as we put the thrust reverser, which tends to throw the thrust forward as the airplane's slowing down on the runway, we didn't want it to pick up uh, object debris off the runway, throw it forward, get sucked back into the engine. And so we were able to model that with the CFD without ever actually having to run that test to understand what the aerodynamics would be and optimize the design for that. I mentioned the high takeoff, uh, the lower right-hand side, and another issue would be whether thrust comes back and gets in with a flap setting or what are those issues at the upper right-hand corner. So those are all examples of different cases we run on the computer uh, before we actually do tests. Now, we still do tests. Uh, we want to validate the models. Um, and this chart here is an example. I have to, it's pretty stark, and that's because I made it. So I'm, no, no smooth graphics here. But I just sort of notionally plotted the extent of computational fluid dynamic usage on the top chart. And we, I don't have a number. It just shows an example of we're increasing a lot. And down, we do have numbers for how many wings we test. <laughs> we actually keep track of that. And you'll notice we've made essentially over the last uh, 25 years an order of magnitude decrease in, in these tests. And that's based upon the fact that we're much smarter in our models. We can do a lot more extensive analysis. And what's not shown here is the fact that we can do a lot more conditions. So we do a lot more analysis of corners of the box, if you will, from the design envelope by, by able to use the computational fluid dynamics. Now, there will be a structures point I'll come back to in this as well. We'll talk about that for structures modeling. But I think that's a great aerodynamic story. Uh, we also have the flight control laws, which are the things that tell under certain conditions what settings the flight control surfaces should be in. We actually put them on a 777. This is an American Airlines 777. We flew it, and we proved out those flight laws. And that, that's, that's behind us now. We've proved that out. Um, uh, from the movie you saw when you came in, Bulls Rolls and GE are flying uh, the engines on the airplanes. Uh, you can see the nacelle with the uh, chevrons in the view of the rolls, but they're also on the GE airplane as well. Um, this is the cockpit. It's uh, evolution, if you will, uh, from the 777 to the next generation. Uh, a lot of things are similar, and we're trying to maintain training commonality between different models to make that easier for pilots to go from one platform to another. Uh, I will point out that the thrust levers, um, uh, let's see, I guess I have to use this mouse to see if that works. Um, in the middle, there are those two little bake-like white things in the middle that right here, if you're the left-hand guy, the, the pilot, um, that's, uh, those are the same, I believe, since the 707. I think every Boeing airplane, if you see pictures, they're always the same, and there's a commonality about that. The screens are totally different up front, but that thrust lever is the same in all the models. Uh, now, I talk about composites. Now, the airplane's only half composite, so calling it a composite airplane is kind of a euphemism. But if you look at the airplane, that, that's the wing and the fuselage and the tail. It's also the floors, the, uh, the frames around inside the fuselage. It's a lot of composites <laughs> for only half. Um, and we want to talk about that somewhat, but I, I think I want to get an idea of the, the impact of the blue. Uh, the second thing is that why do we still have metal on the airplane if it's a composite airplane? Well, there are some areas where metals are still the optimum solution. 
And so the steel, for example, largely around landing gear types of areas where we still use that uh, for the outer cylinders. Uh, there's a lot of titanium. Titanium has some advantages in terms of its uh, corrosion characteristics or lack thereof with carbon uh, from the galvanic coupling. Uh, it also has a, a favorable modulus in certain areas, so volume constrained issues we can use it. Aluminum is still 20% of the airplane, used to be 75% or so, so it's significantly changed. And we use aluminum in places where uh, it's optimized for the aluminum and it doesn't cause us corrosion issues. Aluminum, we use precipitation hardening alloys for all the materials guys out there, and they tend to be prone to its corrosion. And so we do lots of protection for corrosion in today's airplanes. And uh, we also do them here, but here we're even more restrictive in the design window, design criteria uh, about how we use aluminum, which means that we can go back to that chart which shows that 30% gap, and we can back that up with our customers. So this is where you look at the material characteristics, you have to look at the design equation and put them together into a system for a product. Uh, for now, if people might not know what composites are. They're blue in the previous chart. They'll be black the rest of the way, then they'll turn gray. I'll explain that in a moment. But, uh, so it's, it's, not, it's not shifting, it's how we build the airplane. Uh, so they come in forms, and if you have a shirt uh, or a blouse, you know, the fabric weave, the uh, threads cross, well, that's, that's like woven fabric. Uh, there's unidirectional toe, which means the fibers are a little thin strip, all pointing one direction, or unidirectional tape, again, all one direction tape, but a broad good type of product. Thermoplastic, they'll, it, it just shows the fact, the difference is that the fibers can be either uh, uh, straight or uh, woven, uh, but they usually have a little different color to them associated with thermoplastic resin being different than the epoxies. And the top one are typically epoxy resins, and that's the majority of our structural components. Now, they're not your... Uh, McClendon's hardware, they're not your Home Depot, they're not your Lowe's type of epoxies, uh, but they are that general chemical species. Uh, we also use braids, and there's uh, different types of braided type materials. Uh, the liquid resins we actually don't put on with a bucket. Uh, we, it's shown in a bucket. <laughs> we, uh, we have these feed systems and control the flow, and it's a giant, wonderful chemical engineering problem, <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact, uh, but, but it's actually very tightly controlled. Um, this is goes an overview of how you make a composite part. Uh, basically, it's stored cold because the resins are only partially reacted. You uh, cut them, put them in the order and orientation you want. You uh, bag them up or put them in a preparation of a tool. They go into a pressure cooker, essentially, and that's called an autoclave. And in the autoclave, uh, they, we um, uh, both put pressure and vacuum, depending on what cycle we're in. And we uh, compact them and we put, cook them at high temperature for consolidation. At that point, the chemical reaction progresses. The uh, epoxies crosslink and they become, if you will, one giant macromolecule. Uh, you can look at it that way. And I'll show you some very large macromolecules in a few moments. Then you need to trim, inspect, and assemble. You've got a part. Now, one of the interesting, well, let me finish this part, then I'll come to some of the other advantages. Um, automated layup. Uh, this is contour tape lengths, be uh, gentle machines. They're not, some parts are made in my hands. Uh, a wing would use these kind of things. Uh, if you wanted to go round things, you might think in the cells or maybe even fuselage sections. That could be, you know, it looks kind of like that. And this is called fiber placement. And I'll show some more pictures of that and some speed uh, investments that are going there to changing that game. Uh, so the technology to do these things was kind of out there, and what we've done is adapt them to the 787 and move forward uh, on that. Now, one thing uh, I want to talk about, why would you do composites? What, what would be in it? I mean, it's, maybe it's a little lighter, but how much lighter can it be? It also allows us to do some very interesting things. This in particular case is when you get an airplane, the airplane's at 35,000 feet or some number like that, you're not actually at 35,000 feet local altitude pressure. You're not, the air is pretty thin up there. And so we pressurize the cabin for you, and that's a good thing. And uh, uh, we typically take up to about 8,000 feet. And, and you're sitting there, and most of the time you're not running around and trying to exercise and treadmills. So most, it, most, that's just what we do. And there's a trade space there that we go through with aluminum airplanes. Uh, and the idea is the delta pressure between 8,000 and 35,000 is, is a, a hoop stress, if you will, on the fuselage pressurization cycle. That generates fat, uh, fatigue cycling if you will. And aluminum airplanes, uh, well, any airplane, the bigger the delta P, if you will, the change in pressure inside, the higher the stress. And so you just you can work that out. Uh, with aluminum airplanes, there's kind of an economic trade, how much it weighs, what it carries, what's the comfort. And, and we sort of standardize everybody. They're about the same. They're about 8,000 feet. Almost all the airplanes you get on around there. 
Uh, and it's because if we met, wanted to go to a lower altitude, a larger gap between 6,000 and 35,000 versus 8,000, 35,000, we'd add a, lot, add a lot of material. And we started adding a lot of material uh, for this cycling and this uh, cyclic fatigue, then we end up uh, becoming non-economic. You know, we end up changing the economics of the airplane. So the uh, economic equation kind of balances out around 8,000. But with a composite material for the fuselage, and I got to put this in, with our design equation, which I'll come to in a moment, we don't get the same fatigue response. And the polymer composites are quite different than metals in how they respond, and particularly the design strains we operate at. And in those cases, because we believe we have data, that we can operate at this larger delta P in that fuselage area without the fatigue consequence, we are able to consider changing that change pressure. So we took some people and we put them in boxes. I mean, this is uh, a box, I guess, is the way to say that. It's a big box. It looks like the inside of an airplane. It's got seats in it. People sit there. We had people be flight attendants and move it. And we, out, we gave them a trans-Pacific uh, uh, or trans-oceanic flight. And they didn't go anywhere, by the way. They, they stayed there on the ground. But uh, uh, we, we, we then asked them after the flight how they felt. And so it's just a perception type of thing. You can do physiological stuff. So we're doing perceptions. And this red curve, then, is the slope of the data we had. And it said that at 8,000 people, can I say, oh, okay, but, you know, at 6,000, they felt a lot better on average. And below that, they didn't feel a lot different than that. And so that's how we kind of zoned in on 6,000 feet cabin altitude. And we use that as the basis for the pressurization of the 787. Now, I wish I could tell you we're the only guys to do it, but the reality is the business jet guys also do this, and I know there's some other companies in that market who are also advertising the same thing, and they're coming in about 6,000 feet, as I recall. So as the industry moves, this is where composites will take the industry. This is, this is where the physics takes you. But it's kind of interesting to live in it. So we are able to offer a customer feature for that that you couldn't do easily in aluminum without a lot of weight and cost trade against doing that. Uh, when you looked at windows, uh, these are the things you look out. You know, a window is a hole in a pressure vessel. That's a stress concentration. And again, you're balancing the size, and you've got to put material around that hole to reinforce it. Um, uh, and particularly since now we have the pressure cycling again and get the fatigue characteristics of aluminum. So the consequence is the metal airplanes have windows kind of like on the left-hand side. That's, those are a couple of typical actual airplane sizes. On the 787, our studies with the customer experience said people would prefer larger windows. And uh, to do that in a metal airplane, you could put them in too, but again, you add a lot more material, you add a lot of mass. It becomes uh, uneconomical in terms of the mission and what people want to pay for the airplane. But in a composite, it's a fairly straightforward thing to do. So we were able to get much larger windows. And in fact, if you sit on the aisle of a 787, you get a pretty good look out the window. And that's not true in today's airplanes. Uh, you have to lean over people, duck around them, or whatever it is. So this is, again, a, 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 a feature we can put in the airplane not because, well, we can do it because of composites, but we, can, it, it's, we went to composites for fuel efficiency and for weight, but it also enabled additional things to be done uh, in terms of the airplane architecture. Now, I want to talk about the composites we use. That's those polymer, epoxy, uh, carbon fiber reinforced materials. Uh, a lot of people think it's brand new, and, and I, I want you to know the wings and the fuselage and the tail use the same material we use for over 600 airplanes that are flying in service, and that's the 777 basis. The 777 tail, which was introduced in 1995 as in entry into revenue service, uh, used that same material. And so we've got a lot of experience with that in terms of durability, in terms of how well it performs in real life situations. Uh, and it's high confidence value going in. So what we ended up doing, we went to the composite part of the business. We didn't have to change it for a new composite material. Now, we do have some new composite materials on the airplane, and they earned their way on, if you will. But we didn't have to do the whole airplane out of new, new stuff. Um, and this allows me to talk about some other things we learned in 777. We learned about one other really interesting facet of composites you might not think about. And that's the manufacturing. Turns out people think composites are expensive, and they're certainly not inexpensive uh, as a material. But if you look at the whole life cycle cost, that showed you maintenance costs and so on, and weight improvements and fuel efficiency, and you look at the manufacturing cost, look at the cost of tooling, the cost of shimming and fitting things together, what we found with the 777 tail was how wonderfully consistent the material gave us 
made parts for us. And so we reduced the amount of shims we planned to do, which is essentially variations in assembly. We found because we have very low coefficient thermal expansion, uh, CTE, of the materials, that even if we had parts made in factories around the world in different places, they'd still come together in Everett and fit. So you had to get them right in the first place. They wouldn't fix that. But once you got them right, it didn't really matter where they are. So from a manufacturing point of view, our experience in the 777 and our experience in the first airplane assembly says these things are fabulous for the manufacturing guys. So it turns out that the, the reasons we go for composites, not only for weight, but also for manufacturing, and once you go into that area, you get rid of tools, you get rid of monuments in your shops, you get rid of all kinds of infrastructure that you got used to with an aluminum airplane, and you, when we go through the pictures of our final assembly, you'll notice how clean it is, how few tools there are compared to, a, say, a 4.7 line or a 7.6.7 line. And, 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 and that, that tremendous difference in, in sensibility, it comes out from the composite. Kind of a, uh, I think a lot of people don't understand the manufacturing benefits we get out. We also had a lot of experience with that material. Well, we've done uh, lots of tests in the 777 days, full-scale tests, all the analysis, the allowables, had wonderful data, a lot of confidence going into this program. Um, so when we go into this program, we talk about how we structurally analyze and certify airplanes. It's kind of useful to spend a couple seconds on that because this process where we start at the bottom with material screening and we do coupons on the specs and what are called allowables, that's a statistical distribution of the, how strong things or stiff things are. We do elements and subcomponents and three stringer panels with the skins and stringers on them. Uh, we'll do components, a component test, we'll talk about that, I'll show you the wing, for example, we're doing a component test on right now, and we end up with a full-scale test. We, we'll build a static test airplane and a fatigue test airplane. Now, that's what we do in a metal airplane, and we're doing the same thing in a composite airplane. So the discipline and the rigor is the same between the two processes. The details will vary because the structural architecture is different, but the process of validation is the same. Uh, point real quick here, just to define some terms, we talk about different load factors and limit, ultimate load and limit load. So all our parts are designed initially to be ultimate load. That's one and a half times the highest load we expect to see in an airplane. That's called limit load. That's the middle column. And that's for non-detectable and acceptable damage levels. And so there are those kind of numbers we compute when we talk about how we do that when we talk about the wing test. There are also detectable damage that we expect to be found. And until it is found and we go through a variety of inspections, we expect the, the parts still be good for the worst case and in, in, in the airplane's going to see in its lifetime. And if there's something that happens um, uh, that the flight crew will know, and flying into hail would be an example, for example, that's a safety issue, uh, there could be damage, the flight crew knows it, and then, then we have continued safe flight and landing uh, loads, and that's a little different. So we have a discipline we go through, and this is true for metal airplanes and true for composite airplanes. And so this is the same process we, we use for both. Uh, in terms of the structure's design criteria, uh, we design for lots of things. I'm just doing the structures part now. I'm not doing a whole, there's a wheel for systems too, sort of spin the wheel around, pick the topic. But design load, static, and stiffness, durability, damage tolerance, crash, uh, worthiness, maintainability, environment, and discrete events. Tonight, I'm going to go through this wheel. I'm not going to go through all the parts. We can show some examples on the static strength, the fatigue testing, on the fuselage, some wing, uh, fuselage blade test, how we handle uh, damage tolerance there. Um, uh, crashworthiness, uh, some repair discussions, and some examples of bird strike, tire debris, and hail. So you get an idea of the kinds of things that we do as part of the normal airplane development process. Starting with the design equation. Uh, we often get people come to us, say, they got a, particularly suppliers, they've got a new material, and it's really strong. You, you'll really like it. It's 15% stronger than the one I gave you last week. Um, and something like that. And so uh, the reality is that we don't use materials in that sense. We, we have a variety of what are called knockdown factors. And we know when we build materials that we allow a certain amount of alignment of fibers to vary because the manufacturing can't be perfect every time for parts that are 19 and a half feet in diameter. So we, we allow plus or minus X degrees. Uh, and that's, that's just part of our design process. We know that will happen. We look at repair conditions and those damage I just talked about, the allowable damage limits, for example. Uh, and we'll also look at the effect of environment. These things get hot, they get cold, they get wet, they get dry, they're exposed to fluids. When we go through that, we actually end up with that green bar. That's what we actually use as our design base. And so when people bring us a new thing, unless they understand this, 
we, we have to go do all those tests. And so we're trying to help people understand this process. Because really, if you could take a material that was no stronger, but maybe had better resistance to one of these other knockdown factors, that would translate into a better design material from a strength point of view. Now, I put down strain there, because actually in composites, we, we talk about design strains rather than strengths. But uh, that's the, it's a Hooke's law. You can play back and forth. In terms of the kinds of testing, Dr. Crunch is a machine down at Vought. It's a multi-axial test, uh, a variety of load conditions at the same time. We have other frames in Puget Sound and Russia that do similar things. We look at uh, big panels. Uh, this upper right hand is a biaxial uh, type uh, t shear test. There's pull-offs in the lower right hand corner. So we're, we're down and doing these little elements I'm talking about in that triangle. We're, we're marching our way up. Uh, we have some larger panels. The left hand side is a wing panel. It's a lower wing. You can tell there's around holes there. And I have to tell you, the bizarre thing is the people crawl through those things in the real airplane. I'm just amazed. They don't hire guys like me to go do that. Um, uh, and on the right hand side is another big panel, compression panel. And I circle the person in the picture <laughs> so you know where to look. <laughs> That's a person. You get an idea of scale on that, in that photograph. Uh, this is an interesting test. This is the damage uh, arrestment. Uh, what you have in the left or left hand corner is a, a fuselage barrel. That's a, it's, it's a composite barrel. It's put in a in chamber and it's pressurized. And we actually paint a grid on it on the right hand side. And we'll shoot a blade through it under pressure. And, and this, this is a simulating a, a flight event that might happen or in, uh, something would happen to the engine and it wouldn't be contained and hit the fuselage and create a hole in flight. And the criteria is it did not. Uh, uh, cause the airplane to, to discontinue safe flight. Uh, the lower side is actual picture. Is that the way you say that? <laughs> um, uh, worded that carefully. Uh, is, is a close-up of the fracture surface. And, and what, what's interesting is, is how it depressurizes. And this, this is important because uh, there's a long history of understanding this type of phenomenon in airplanes. Now we'll do a bird strike. Uh, the lower left hand's uh, a barrel we built. Well, it'll repeat itself. You didn't miss anything. Uh, and, and I'll talk a minute about it's gray, those are the guns, and you see now, you notice that doesn't look like a bird, first of all, right? And, and that's because it's not actually a bird. Uh, we, we no longer use birds. Uh, this is a gel pad. Uh, I, yeah, there's a variety of reasons I couldn't give you that video. Um, but um, the, the criteria here is if you get a bird strike, uh, we have to have, you know, control the damage, know what's going on. That's, a, that's an event that the uh, flight crew does know happens, and then they have to fly the, the plane for continuous safe, uh, safe flight and landing. And the airplane is zoned where it is. Now, I want to point out a little thing. That, that gray thing in the lower left is the nose of the airplane, and that is actually a carbon thing. It's black. We put a gray material on there for surfacing, and it's a surfacing material we use for paint and adhesion and for surface smooth paint. So even though I'm telling it's carbon, and you say, gosh, it looks kind of like a metal thing, it's really gray, and this is that surfacing layer on there that does that. Another example would be tire impacts. Uh, uh, airplane tires are uh, pressurized to high pressures, and uh, uh, they, things can happen to them, and if they do, they happen at high velocity, and the, the criteria, therefore, in this case, is that the, the tire tread being thrown doesn't go up, hit the bottom of the wing, and puncture it, uh, particularly are the access doors, uh, those little round things we tested earlier, uh, so that you don't get a big fuel leak and then uh, some sort of fire scenario. So this is the gun we would fire, and in the back you can see the panel with the green uh, area representing the access door. And this will be now, when I run the video, you'll see some white plastic coming in, and that's the Sabo. That's what helps control the puck orientation down the gun. And it itself is very light, gets out of the way, then you'll see this black puck come in and hit the door. And the good news is it bounces. It's sort of the Wayne Gretzky memorial puck. Uh, let's see if it comes. Did I hit it hard enough? Here it comes. Okay. Move this out of the way. And you can see the puck coming in there. It says DU DUC 73 and hitting. And it hits, now that's just a couple hundred miles an hour it's coming in, so this is a slow version. But it's a lot of energy coming through in a hurry. And, and the criteria is that we don't puncture that area. Uh, it's not a very common event, but it's one you have to, it's part of our design criteria. So doing these composites, I kind of give you an idea for the, the detail we go to, the kind of analyses, things we're involved in. Uh, talk about hail. Uh, this is a map of the United States from NOAA. Actually, would, they keep track of hail for us, not for airplanes, for farmers. There's a great agricultural database of where hail happens. And these are days of hail greater than three quarters of an inch. And the red colors, six days a year, are kind of in that Midwest zone. And right by Texas, there's an X. And that happens to be Dallas-Fort Worth. 
uh, which you could argue the United States probably sizes airplanes of the world for that condition. <laughs> it's my opinion, but uh, it's certainly one of the cases that does. And you can see why we don't know much about hail out here in the rest of the West. We don't get much hail. <laughs> so uh, you have to go back there. Um, I'm going to show you a video of, of a hailstorm, uh, just for those of you who haven't seen them recently. Uh, they look like this. They can be pretty violent. You know, this is a very serious issue, and you've got a very expensive airplane sitting there on the ground. Uh, you want to know what's going to happen, and you want to be able to design it for that. So we, we have people who are physicists, who wouldn't be engineers, they'd be physicists who would do this, who then go back and look at this, you know, sort of count the hail balls frame by frame as it comes down and see where they go. And what we were finding is that hail balls uh, that get to a certain size, golf, baseball, they shatter when they hit the pavement, which is an interesting data point. Uh, the big ones on there are, didn't actually bounce, they hit the ground and rolled on. Uh, and their small ones actually do bounce. And so there's a lot of analysis of this footage uh, to do that, to kind of help, because what we were trying to do is understand hail. Now, interesting business, there are people who make their living chasing these storms. <laughs> and we hired one of them to help us get some hail. <laughs> and we even had a composite panel on there and some things for cladding things. There's the inside of it, if you see in the light there, there's a high-speed video camera and a bunch of computer stuff. And, and I was thinking to myself, what an interesting job to chase storms around the Midwest. Uh, um, so I guess I never saw that movie. Was it Tornado or whatever it was? With Jodie Foster or something like that? So never saw that. Uh, but here's another some data we did. Uh, we didn't actually buy the car. This happened. <laughs> and I put the hail ball up there. The NTS stands for not to scale. Um, it wasn't actually... <laughs> It really wasn't that big, but I wanted you to know there was a hail ball there, not just a red arrow. And um, so it hit about 20 miles an hour, from what we could tell. And so we did some lab tests, and you can see between 60 and zero, we, we did kind of in between. It kind of made sense to us. So this was kind of getting our confidence up. And now, this is a little busy chart. I'll, I'll walk you through it, because there's a lot going on. We wanted to model the hail damage events accurately so we could get an optimum design. So we, we looked at the dynamic impact of behavior of hail in the upper left-hand corner. and the lower left-hand corner, we're doing a test of ice, a high-speed test. Okay, So we're, we're simulating this thing coming out, hitting it at high velocity. From that, we can understand the hail physics, how they break up, what they do. Remember that thing, that guy running around the truck. So we're getting that kind of data to put into this. On the other side, we, we're looking at our composite layups. We say, okay, for these different hail energy events, what kind of damage would be created? What things would happen? Then we would go impact panels and assess them and, and model it, essentially prove that the model worked, which would allow us to come with an integrated model for design criteria. So, the, so we went into the hail studies. We actually had a pretty good database of how hail works, what the response is, and some real life data behind it to back it up. Now, we'd always done this for metal airplanes. What we want to do is we're trying to optimize the design for the composites. So that's, that's why we end up going down this path. So the interesting corners of the box a new airplane will take you into. Uh, we also did a, a fuselage uh, a crash worthiness, a, a barrel drop. Uh, we wanted to show, uh, we'll talk about why it's a half barrel in a moment, but we, we have an exotic model. Uh, it's a very extensive computer model, much like the CFD stuff I talked about aerodynamics. This is the structures equivalent to that level of sophistication, as you'll see. Um, talk about how we got there. Uh, in this case, there, back in 2000, there was a barrel drop. The FAA did one, and they, by dropping, I mean they dropped it at a certain speed. They see the damage uh, absorption, instrumented the airplane, so we had a baseline. That data was taken, put into a model. For, we, we took that, the lower left-hand side, into a 737 size model. So we, what's called, a, a name is not important, but it's a model that actually models it in very fine detail. We then took it to a 777 size, because the 787 and the 777 are closer in size than 737. We then took, so we had a metal 777 barrel on the computer, and then we created a composite 87 barrel on the computer, and we did all this testing up above the elements, floor elements, skin elements, stiffening elements, to put in the model. So this is a very complex model. And then we built the simulated composite fuselage drop, and then we took a half barrel and we put, it, we put uh, uh, containers in it with load. We put seats in or the things representing seats where people would be. We put the balance so it acted like it was a whole fuselage, even though we were only doing half. That was just a convenience for the test. And then we did replicated it. So we said, what does the model predict and what do we get? How accurate is our model going to be and over what conditions? Uh, talk about fatigue. Uh, we talked about cyclic loading. And, and we have fatigue where we expect cracks... Uh, 
uh, damage that this allowable damage limit type thing not to grow during the life of the airplane. There are other larger damage things that should be found in inspection, but we'll actually test in fatigue to prove that the thing, even if they missed them in, detect, in detection, they'll still, the airplane will still be uh, safe. Uh, we do this not by just walking around the airplane looking. We do things called probability of detection studies, which we bring all kinds of mechanics in in different situations, and we give them different size things to find, and we look at the statistics of probability of them finding that, and we use that weighted statistical data. So there's a whole science about how you do inspection things. It's not just what you see. We're making a lot of assumptions about it. So I'm going to show you just a real quick, this would be a fuselage fatigue test uh, done a couple of years ago. Uh, so here we go. So in this case, uh, the, uh, you're seeing the skin side inside our infrastructure, like uh, stringers or stiffening elements, and we circle the areas where, uh, or marked them out in pin, where we deliberately introduce damage. And what we're doing now, we're, this is buckling there, which means we're really overloading it more than we expect in an airplane. But we're really trying to find out where we can go, how how fast or how slow will cracks grow. And, and what we're seeing, you get the idea of the deflection we're putting into the part, um, that we don't, we, we get a very good behavior, we don't get crack growth uh, in, in these lower damage levels uh, over at least the design, multiple tests of the design service objective of life. So we've done multiple airplane lifetimes equivalent without uh, getting crack growth. And it's kind of exciting. And that's, that, that is one of the real advantages of composites if you stay within your design window. I never want to say things don't fatigue because it's a function of how you design it. So you have to also incorporate design as well as material properties. But you get an idea of the deflections we're talking about there. Then we go on to the wing. Now, there is a wing in there. You have to trust me on this. Uh, back in the white where the airplane is, or the flag, I'm sorry, is the root of the wing. And in between is the box, uh, the black you can see, and the orange thing here would be where the tip is. So this wing is two-thirds length, but full size in that dimension. And the reason is the end we didn't need, and we needed to do that to introduce the loads. So this thing is now through uh, roughly uh, some, some, some weeks ago through two design lives. Uh, and we're continuing, I'll explain the sequence we do. We actually introduce this non-visible damage state into the uh, wing box. We do a whole bunch of spectrums uh, and, we, and then we inspect it. We make sure the strains are right and we look for damage, growth, or any of those things. We do that for three uh, uh, design service objectives, or three lifetimes, to quote, of the airplane. Then we'll come back and we'll uh, deliberately damage the airplane by using a saw cut to something we expect to be an inspectable condition. And then we'll test it through multiple, like two, at least two different inspection cycles, assuming they've missed the inspection once that they should have caught. So we make sure that's there. And then we'll take it and do even more damage to it that should have been something equivalent to the flight crew knowing something, something catastrophic that happened. And so they would show it's still good for this design uh, limit load for this continued safe flight, I should say, that is the right word. Then we'll repair it and take it back and show it's still good for ultimate strength. And that's, that's the basic format of how we're doing the component test in front of the airplane test. Now we'll do the similar type of testing on the fuselage, different details, but similar type of protocol uh, rigor. Uh, so we'll have this day type of data on the, sta on the horizontal stabilizer and the uh, uh, fuselage, the wing, and so on uh, as part of the process, leading up to the full-scale airplane test. Now the other thing is we have to re we design by, for repair. And this is a really important point that a lot of people don't understand uh, is that we, we, we assume that the airplane's going to get damaged. Now, it's not necessarily damaged by airplane flight conditions. Um, things like trucks and cargo handling things uh, are more common. Um, but they, they do get damaged in service. And so we have to be able to repair it. And it turns out that a lot of the areas we get into that the repair criteria are uh, equally as stringent as the airplane flying criteria. And so a lot of our structure ends up being influenced by repair as much as it gets influenced by the actual flight. So we, we have a built-in system redundancy, if you will, or capability that we have to be able to repair, whether it's with bolting or bonding or any number of approaches. Uh, we're getting ready for static tests. Uh, uh, the fixtures are being built. It'll be a big, big thing. We also will have a fatigue test airplane. Uh, we also do burn-through testing and, and, and uh, talk for a moment about that. We do uh, a couple of different things. Uh, first of all, the interior of the cabin has its own requirements for interior's uh, uh, flammability characteristics. That doesn't change for the 787 versus other airplanes. Uh, 
But the composite skin is in fact different. And what we uh, have demonstrated by test with, with the uh, regulatory agency is uh, both burn through characteristics, which is in a post crash fuel fed fire, that's the specific scenario that's being addressed, that the flames have to not penetrate into the cabin for I think it's a five minute uh, criteria. Uh, actually, in composites, uh, we've tested as long as 20 minutes. Uh, and, and it's much different than aluminum, which tends to be a metal, gets to the melting point, and dissipates. We also control the things that come off uh, from the composite, which is, is, is still kind of like the smoke from a post crash fuel fed fire. And we've shown that that's equivalent to an aluminum airplane as well. And we do that by the same strategy of how we use insulation blankets on the airplane. That's how aluminum airplanes are done. The other thing we do is we have to protect against what's called in-flight fires. An in-flight fire is a short, and probably may take you more than you want to know about airplanes. But you have a fuselage here, we put a foam panel here, we soak it in heptane and we light it. And that's, this is a standard uh, flammability test for in-flight fires. And then it has not to burn, and this just sets there for until it burns out. And so there's some belief that because it's a polymer that it will burn, and, and the answer is it doesn't. It is not, this is not those kind of polymers. They're very fire resistant. So this, we think this is an area of fabulous uh, advances as well in this area. In terms of the actual parts that are made around the world, so the tail, uh, for example, in the far left-hand side, the little tail cone comes down. It's actually made uh, in, in Korea. The horizontal stabilizer is in Italy. The, that's the, 40, well, the, the 48th section uh, is part of Vought's. 47 is made by Vought in South Carolina. 46 and 44 being Italy. 43 in Japan. 41 in Wichita, Kansas, uh, doing the fuselage. Uh, on the wing, the big wing box is made in Japan. The trailing edges that move are made in Australia. The ones that are fixed are made in Japan. The leading edges are made in Oklahoma. So you get an idea how this all works. <laughs> Fascinating process. Uh, so she's in pictures. And, and, and now, the, unlike goldfish, we just rotate it on the tool. It's not actually sick. <laughs> so it's okay for the fuselage to be upside down in that picture. Uh, you can also see on the right hand, left, right hand side there, that gray I'm talking about. And one point I'm putting out, when we make the parts, we actually leave them on the tool, then cut the windows out on the tool. An interesting process. We don't take it out of the tool and try to put the windows in. So we keep it in the right architecture, right geometry, to put the windows and doors in. Uh, this is the Vought air, uh, parts, the aft end of the airplane. This is the linea, the middle part we were talking about. Uh, this is a picture, a little older picture, but I just put it in to show you in the intermediate stages before we get to the uh, uh, parts that are uh, uh, that gray on the outside. They really are black. Uh, now, Peter Z is here tonight from Electro Impact. I don't know if you, where you're at out there. Uh, but this is a, a system that we uh, developed with his company. And this is the trickiness of the various architectures. You know, it's going to be this thing. Uh, we want to run the video here. What it's doing is it's putting down a swath uh, of that unidirectional tape. And I, and I, and I kind of showed this uh, as an example of the kind of technology speeds that are happening to make things move faster. And so you're seeing a lot of automation. And that, this is a test uh, article, not a real barrel. But you get an idea how fast these things move. And, and that's kind of a relevant data. I'm going to just jump out of this video, which keeps putting the same ply down. Um, to show this chart, which is one of the things you get into the composites, you know, if you're going to have a composite airplane, you're going to build a lot of them, you've got to put a lot of material down in a hurry. <laughs> you can't go slow. And so part of the economics is you've got to do it very fast. And so the black curve goes back to 1980, and we see we're already up two orders of magnitude, and it really took off with the advances of our program. And we have a dotted line and projected, and, and that thing I just showed you, the multi-spindle, multi-head, is up on that dotted line. Okay, that's where we expect it to go. And we, what's interesting is, uh, and maybe Peter can comment on it, but I think the, the interesting theme here is a lot of the technology and computer controls, uh, the knowledge of stiffness of things, and how things move in space, a lot of that came from the high-speed metals machining industry, and a lot of that same industry base is working in this area. So it's interesting how that, that moves from one industry sector to another for a totally different purpose. Uh, composites, if they had to start from scratch, probably wouldn't do it, but barring from the metals industry, worked pretty good. Um, this is the wings, I'll tell you about that giant macromolecule, that's an upper and that's an inside part. There's circled the people out there so you get an idea, uh, the size. And you can kind of estimate two-thirds of the length and that would be for the structural test box. Uh, the center section from Fuji, 
Uh, we're looking at the, another pressure deck here from Kawasaki. Uh, here's the landing gear guys, Messier Dowdy. Uh, that lower left hand part's kind of interesting because that's a uh, drag brace. It's probably four and a half, five feet long. Very thick composite, very braided. And I mentioned one reason we use a titanium aluminum, a variety of reasons, but one reason is metals are really good for moving loads around a corner, three dimensional loads. And uh, composites are really good at shells, if you'll thin things like wings and fuselage. In this case, uh, this part is starting to move us into the thought process of can you get composite parts that move loads around corners? And the gauges are very thick here. We think this is an emerging area of technology in composite. Aft pressure bulkheads, composite, that's the back end of the airplane that holds it together. Uh, this is the vertical fin, Fredrickson, uh, and Puyallup. And now the parts come to us from around the world. This is the interesting part of the business. So on the right hand side shows the section 43, uh, section 1145 going to Charleston, South Carolina. The wing and the lower right hand guys goes from Nagoya, Japan directly to Everett. Uh, we have this thing called a dream lifter, I'll show you next, going to talk about that does that. Parts come from Italy to South Carolina. Uh, they also go from Wichita directly to Everett, and the joint sections go from uh, South Carolina to, to Everett. So part of it's a global production system view. We move those parts around the world. If you saw the video earlier, as we had it running ahead of time, so the tail open, the back of the airplane, stuff in uh, fuselage sections. We actually put wings in as well. Um, it's kind of the almost like a ship in a bottle type thing. You know, if you just pull that string and open it up. So this is the Dream Lifter. There's two of them on the tarmac last night, or Sunday night when I was in, in work. This is the production line, uh, just showing kind of a lean line, not very clean. We'll see some pictures in a moment. It's the right-hand door, far side of the factory. If you don't want to, if you drive by the fair, don't look at the left hand, look at the right-hand side. That's where the 787 is. Um, this is the factory for their first airplane. You can see those gray body sections where the, the composite, the covering, putting the wing together uh, onto the fuselage. Uh, we see the nose of the airplane. Uh, doors are composites. This is a subtlety, you kind of lose track. Well, the doors come, and the metal, the mechanisms are metal, metallic, but the door itself is composite. Skin. Uh, the vertical uh, fin in the back, the horizontal stabilizer. In fact, you can see an old aft pressure bulkhead uh, on the upper side, that green thing up there, or a few slices. Th those aren't ours. <laughs> those are metal designs. <laughs> yeah, much busier. Uh, this is the tail on the airplane. And this will walk through the original airplane. Uh, you saw those pictures on the internet before the rollout. Well, the guy stood the freeways. This airplane rolled out the door and took a picture of it. That's what he did. <laughs> so this is what they look like painted. Covered up the windows. And uh, cleans up pretty good. Um, now this is the actual roll-in ceremony, because it actually came into the hangar. Uh, here's the flight attendants from our launch uh, airlines. Uh, this is the people rushing out to the airplane. Uh, you, this is happy customers. Trust me, they're happy. <laughs> they're happy. <laughs> uh, this is the airplane. I think this is the next two pictures are really nice. I mean, this one, people are touching an idea of the surface finish and quality. And that picture, to me, really captures the sense of this program. I mean, it's the size of the airplane. You see the thousands and hundreds of people who've helped bring it together. And this is just a small fraction of the people who actually you know, labored uh, a lot of serious effort to bring it together. I mentioned the efficiency earlier and the features like the windows and the features like the cabin altitude, the lower maintenance costs, and the airlines really like the fuel burn numbers. Uh, uh, the fact that this airplane flies long distances. You know, one of the things I, 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 I want to point out, when an airplane that flies a long distance does for you, if it's this size, you have the choice. Of, do you fly a 787? Do you fly a... 777, 747, uh, 737, what, how do you choose an airplane? And so an airplane sort of for a route is based upon its capability, it's gonna do the mission, and the load factor. Uh, how many people do you have to have on that route for the airplane to pay for itself? Now I always tell people airplanes are kind of like bank certificates of deposit. You put money in and you hope to get money back. And if you do it well, you get a little bit more than you put in, and if you don't do it well, you don't get as much money back, and that's, that's a bad thing. So from an investment point of view, the 787 and this schedule and this range really does satisfy a niche in the market. And we think one of the reasons is people would like to fly point to point. When I showed the Narita chart earlier, the noise, and I we could have showed Heathrow, we could have showed Frankfurt, Tel Aviv, any number of airports around the world. Um, I usually ask the audience how many people have been to Narita. Don't have to do it tonight. I can't count all the hands. Uh, 
And I asked how many people wanted to go to Narita. Usually most of the hands go down at that point. <laughs> and uh, so people are going through there because of this hub and spoke model. And the reality is the 787 opens up point to point flying. We believed uh, early on, and maybe even better now, about 450 passenger, uh, sorry, 450 city pairs could be served economically by the 787. Remember, this is an economic argument, not can you fly that far. There are plenty of airplanes that can fly as far as the 787, but at the load factor and the efficiency, it opened up markets that would not be economically served by a 747 or even a 777. And so part of the issue with the replacing the older fleets with the new airplane for that niche of the middle of the market, that green part of the pie we're talking about, was also that it offered a lot more flexibility in the future state of where you can fly the airplane. So getting this airplane out there is a very big deal from our customers because they not just want it for what they're doing now, they want to expand their market and go into new areas. And so it's caused a lot of excitement. And this is the kind of excitement you end up getting when you get 738 orders, 51 customers. And there are some famous name airlines not on that list that are going to be looking for airplanes. And so this, this, this thing is not over yet. And now this is an amazing set of orders. As you may have pointed out from the previous chart, we haven't delivered one yet. So, so there's a lot of people with faith in us that we're going to do that. And so that's a very serious responsibility on our side to do. Uh, we haven't updated this chart for the 730 some orders, but you get an idea here how many orders this thing has generated since launch of the 787. And the NG, which had been the previous record holder, is an airplane that's not just over half as big. It's probably 60% the size of this airplane. So if you look at lift in terms of seats rather than airplanes in the y-axis, it's much more pronounced. So with that, I've described an airplane concept, why we did it, talked a little bit about the kinds of technologies, uh, aerodynamics, a little bit of systems, a lot of composites. Uh, some noise, environmental issues. Talked about the, uh, how we certify airplanes and, and the kind of reasons we have confidence in it. And then lastly, some pictures of what it looks like and, and how it actually is starting to materialize and become real. And with that, I want to thank you for your time. <laughs> now, it now gives me great pleasure and probably you, even greater pleasure, to introduce Mark Tuttle. Mark uh, is a chairman of the uh, Mechanical Engineering Department. Mark's also a fellow I've been working with the last several years, the FAA Center of Excellence out here. And Boeing and the uh, Mechanical Engineering Department had extensive interactions with the Aeronautics Department uh, as well in terms of the structures of composites and, and the regulatory agency engagement. It's been a very collaborative activity across many different industry sectors. And with that, Mark. Well, thank you, Al, and uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, as you can now see, it's, uh, Al Miller is a very tough act to follow. Uh, Al and I agreed to give this lecture uh, probably four or five months ago, and so we both began to uh, uh, develop material for the talk, and at the time, the idea was Al was going to talk about the 787 and more generally about the use of composites in aerospace industry. And I talk about the use of composites in non-aerospace industries and also my guess, my best guess on the next generation of advanced materials. So Al and I got together, uh, I guess it was maybe two weeks ago, two, three weeks ago, and uh, you know, compared notes. And it quickly became apparent that between the two of us, we could keep you all here until the wee hours in the morning. So I've... Uh, Al actually cut back on some of the things he had to show, and I'm going to cut back on my presentation and talk strictly about the use of composites in non-aerospace industries. Um, if anybody wants to talk about my guess at next uh, advanced materials after the talk, I'd be willing or very happy to talk with you, but I'll, I'll try to limit my talk to just non-aerospace composites for, and furthermore, step briskly through my presentation. Let's start here. Uh, as you just saw, carbon fibers are going to be used extensively in the 787 program. And uh, what this chart shows, and by the way, this chart is in your industry estimates that were assembled by Boeing. Uh, this shows the estimated worldwide carbon fiber demand for a 10-year period. This was a, 
generated about a year and a half ago. So the very first year you see on the left is for 2006. And uh, they estimated what carbon fibers would be used until 2016. The Boeing company is the light gray box. Airbus is the light blue. Other aerospace companies is the darker blue. And industry and recreation is the red box. And you can see immediately that carbon fiber is, is used far more widely in industries other than aerospace. So the question is, where do these fibers go? What are they used for? And also note that uh, we're not talking about fiberglass, another advanced composite. Or we're not talking about Kevlar, which you probably have heard of in the, in the case of a bulletproof vest, for example. This is strictly carbon fiber. So the question is, where do all these fibers go? Uh, this uh, sketch or, uh, figure is intended to show that, uh, or I guess the point is that composite materials, associated technologies, advanced materials are very commonly developed or driven by the aerospace industry. I've mentioned fiberglass that was developed in the 1940s for use in aerospace, but as these materials become available, they actually migrate and are used in many other industries, just about any industry that has a product. And I'm going to step through some example use of composites in the industries as I've uh, sketched them here. I won't read through all these, but you can see that there's composites are used in energy, in marine, in automobiles, etc. And let's go through uh, some examples of this. And what I hope, if you don't realize this already, the 787 is a new, exciting new material or airplane made of this advanced composites. But I'll bet every one of you have already used the composite structure. And if not used it personally, your lives as are, uh, are touched in some way by composites, advanced composites already. So let's go through some examples. Let's start with the marine industry. As I mentioned, fiberglass was developed in the 40s for the aerospace company, or industry. F the most widely successful application of fiberglass is in boats. I show here a 41-foot hunter sailboat available through Signature Yachts here in Seattle. 147-foot grand finale yacht, also uh, available uh, through Delta Marine here in Seattle. If you haven't had the opportunity to be on a 41-foot sailboat or a 150-foot yacht, I'll bet every one of you have been on an 18-foot fiberglass runabout. All of you have been in a, quote, advanced composite structures. Now, these are mostly fiberglass, although the high-end yachts, high-end sailboats do have some carbon fibers in it. But if you want high performance, such as an America's Cup sailboat, today virtually all of these are produced with advanced composites, just like those being used in the 787. I picked this particular one, the BMW Oracle Racing uh, uh, America's Cup yacht, because the, um, the molds that produced this boat were designed and built by Janicki Industries, which is up in Cedar Woolley, Washington. Peter Janicki is a UW mechanical engineering graduate from the mid-1980s. Al mentioned uh, Peter Zeev, who's here tonight somewhere. Peter and uh, uh, Peter Zeev and Peter Janicki were classmates. Uh, Janicki Industry has already revolutionized the boating business and is now making uh, molds for the 787 that are used all around the world. Anyway, uh, America's Cups are a good example of a truly high-performance Navy vessel, or boat that is, used from composite, composite materials. How about the Navy applications? Most Navy ships today are still built with steel, but composites are starting to make inroads. This is an artist's conception of a Zomolt-class destroyer being uh, uh, designed and, and hopefully built by Northrop Grumman. This, uh, uh, the ship has a width or beam of about 80 feet, thereabouts, 80 feet wide, about 600 feet long. It's expected to have a total weight or displacement of 14,000 tons, only 3.5% of which will be composites. Now that seems a, long, a low percentage until one realizes, oh, that's 500 tons of composites. As shown in the, ske uh, in the sketch, composites will be used in the hangar section and in the deck house. How about the automobile industry? Perhaps the most famous use of composites, at least in the US, is the Corvette. This is a picture of the original 1953 Corvette designed and built in my hometown of Flint, Michigan. Uh, this was state of the art in 1953. And the Corvette at that time and ever since has uh, 
featured a composite body, a fiberglass body. Now, the 1953 Corvette was built with a fiberglass mat. The glass fibers were discontinuous, about two inches long, in a, in a random fabric kind of a, a mat, which is then impregnated with a, a plastic. Today, the Corvette Z6, that's the 2007 Corvette, still features a fiberglass body, although it's now produced using a woven fabric. Al showed some pictures of a woven fabric. These are continuous fibers woven into a fabric and then impregnated with resin. However, the hood in the Corvette Z6 is, a, is, is produced using a unidirectional carbon fiber, just like the 787. Also, you see the front wheelhouse and the floorboards in the lower left-hand side, or uh, lower left-hand corner of this picture are shown, and they are produced with what's called a carbon molding compound. You might have heard of sheet molding compound in the past. That's glass fibers in a resin. Carbon molding compound is carbon fibers in a resin. Uh, the, uh, they also have added some uh, small glass spheres, micro spheres, in the uh, front wheelhouse, producing a composite with a specific gravity of 1.1, a structural material which nearly floats. Not quite, but nearly floats. It's that light. I don't have any uh, images from the trucking industry tonight to try to cut my talk short, but let me say that these kinds of technologies are also used in Kenworth trucks and Peterbilt trucks uh, that are built here in the state of Washington. Race cars routinely use high-performance autoclave-cured composites, just like those that will be used in the uh, 787. The Honda Formula One car has uh, chassis, suspension, wings, gearbox, and engine covers, all produced using uh, autoclave carbon composites. So this might lead to the question, can I buy a Chevy Malibu that has a composite chassis? Or can I buy a Toyota Camry that has a composite drive shaft? The short answer is no. The use of high performance composites in production vehicles have been inhibited sort of for two reasons. First, high material cost. Now, what's high? Carbon fibers today cost something like about eight to ten dollars a pound, depending on who you talk to. Steel, in contrast, is about two dollars a pound. Secondly, and more importantly, is the low production rates relative to the auto industry. Now, the, the, Al has shown some of the techniques that aerospace structures are, how, how they're being built. The Boeing company produces, let's say, somewhere 15 to, to 25 jets a month, perhaps. The auto industry produces 15 to 25 automobiles a minute, almost. And so the, the sheer number of parts that need to be built to support the high volume industry like automobiles means that the manufacturing techniques that have been used, that have developed by Boeing can't be easily translated to the automobile industry. So, having said so, I do expect you to be able to buy a Chevy, Mal a Chevy Malibu or a Toyota Camry in a few years which use advanced composites for three reasons. As you all know, we need, the gas prices are going up, we need increased fuel efficiency, and we need lower global, or I mean, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and that requires a lighter vehicle. There needs to be a change in the automobile industry in terms of the design philosophies, in particular, a phrase is a reduction in part count. Rather than build a chassis out of multiple parts that are then bolted or welded together, you need to produce the chassis in a part. And finally, improve manufacturing processes that would increase production rates. And these things are happening. There's uh, a demonstration by ATF, which is an Italian company, that shows the sketch shows in a unitized composite monocoque chassis that they've developed, a compression molding of a carbon fiber-based composite. They have been able to produce these at a rate of about 20 per day. Now, they're still far lower than needed, but far higher than the what we now might call traditional composite techniques. Anyway, this is coming. How about energy? How about wind energy? Uh, as you know, windmills have been around for hundreds of years, years have been used for many purposes. Uh, windmills for use in producing electricity have been really seriously studied for about 25 to 30 years, thereabouts. And uh, I can say that, to, to use an overused phrase, there have been a, a lot of out-of-the-box concepts that have been tried with windmills. And what I show uh, in the uh, three lower pictures is a vertical axis windmill. 
people try to see whether that would work better than the more traditional Holland windmill on the left. Let me just say that uh, there, we've got 20, 25 years of engineering experience, and, and more or less uh, today, we've, the engineering community has settled on the optimal shape of a windmill for use in electrical electricity generation involves a horizontal axis with three propellers. Not four, not two, not six, three propellers. There's a lot of engineering analysis that have gone into this. The propeller design, or the blade design that is, uh, has been optimized uh, extensively. So now we have a lot of commercially available wind turbines. I show two small ones, the one on the left, 200 watts. Might, uh, if you bought that, you might be able to light five or six lights in your barn. If you want to light your, or power your home, you need, a, say, a 10 kilowatt uh, <coughs> a windmill or wind turbine as shown on the right side. So you can buy these are commercially available from this size up to those used in large wind farms intended to power entire communities. Uh, wind farms are being built around the country, around the world. One that's close to home is the State Line Wind Project. This is on the border between the state of Oregon and Washington. There's about 450 turbines on the Oregon side, about 450 turbines on the uh, Washington side. Together these will power about 77,000 homes. <clears throat> uh, these are, of course, land-based wind farms. Offshore uh, wind farms are also being considered. There's none, none have been built in U.S. waters, but there's several in Europe, and I've shown a picture of the Danish Horn Rev offshore wind farm, of course, off the course of Denmark. So if you're an engineer working on a wind farm, one question is, do I, do I have a thousand medium-sized wind turbines, or do I have 500 big ones? And what a second engineering experience has showed is that the bigger the better in terms of economics, in terms of what, how much buck do you get for your, uh, how much uh, energy you get for your buck. So the tend is for, towards very large wind turbine, and I've showed these two pictures to show you a little bit of scale. The picture on the left, notice that there's a person standing on top of that turbine housing. Another way to show how big these are is to compare the size of these very large windmills to a 747, as shown on the right. This is the largest windmill in the world. Both of these are in Germany. Vestest is a German company that produces some of the largest uh, uh, wind turbines in the world. Okay, so we've been looking at windmills for, for energy generation for a number of years. Traditionally, if you will, they've been produced using uh, inexpensive fiberglass and wet layup techniques. They do the same thing that Rhinel uses to produce its boats. What's happening with these really big turbines is uh, there are three new design drivers that are emerging. When these blades get so large, the weight of the blades themselves or the wind loads tend to deflect them, so the blade stiffness becomes an issue. What's happening then is we now see increasing use of high performance carbon fibers, just like the 787. And then transportation ends up being an engineering design driver. And that might not be immediately obvious. What does transportation got to do with the design? And the way to illustrate that is maybe through these pictures. Here's some blades being transported from the facility in which they were built to the wind farm. Now, in other words, you have a real issue transporting these large components. The Boeing company saw this with the Dreamlifter. But wind farms are placed in remote areas where there are no airports, there are in fact oftentimes no roads. So the issue here is how do we do this? So there's two things that are happening. Either you, you uh, design these uh, blades with a joint somewhere, say in the middle. The problem with that is if there's any structural engineer here, you know immediately if I put a joint in there, it's heavier. So the other approach is to try to develop new manufacturing techniques which are calling gypsy production techniques, where you would build this blade on site. I mean, you have to build high quality blade, but somehow on site in such a way that can easily move from one farm, one farm to another. How about tidal energy? This is a new technique, a new energy. It's about where wind energy was 20 years ago. Sites are being evaluated in Europe, Canada, and the US, close to home here in the Puget Sound. There's been a newspaper article very recently, seven potential sites nearby, two near Whidbey Island, two near the San White Islands, one near Anacortes, and two along Bainbridge Island. This is early. 
We haven't yet decided what's the optimal configuration, for example. Here are two leading candidates. The one on the top is what I would call an axial tube fan or something that looks like it. That's a traditional way to move air. Maybe we adopt that to tidal energy. Or maybe we have something akin to a windmill or maybe an underwater aircraft propeller. So we're working on this now, or the industry is now. Uh, the idea is to have tidal energy farms. This is an artist's conception. You'd have a whole row of these things. And although the optical, optimal configuration is to be determined, it's a certainty that composites will be used. And here's a 52-foot demonstration rotor made from glass and carbon fiber that is uh, being installed in a demonstration site off the coast of Ireland as we speak. There are two hydroelectric plants being built in Brazil. Of course, any hydroelectric plant has a lot of piping, traditionally steel piping. The Brazilian plants are going to be using composite pipes. Light poles, transmission towers are often produced with composites today. You might have one of these on your block. Electric cables, which transmit power, have been improved through the use of carbon fibers. What this sketch shows is the composite core with aluminum wires wrapped around the outside of it. The upper left that shows the carbon fibers surrounded by glass fibers. Of course, that whole thing is wrapped in an insulator. What you see in the lower right is installation that used this wire outside Niagara Falls, installed in 2004. Let's now turn to infrastructure. On the right-hand side is your standard run-of-the-mill parking garage, a forest of concrete columns. Such columns are subject to damage during earthquake or terrorist blast in post 9-11. So composites are very routinely used to wrap such columns to strengthen them. Uh, existing concrete floors or even new construction can be strengthened with a layer of graphite epoxy on the left. There are many large diameter pipes or, uh, of uh, all types buried throughout the U.S. for, say, sewage treatment plants. <clears throat> they age. <clears throat> you can e extend the life of these pipes by 30 years or more by simply lining them with composites. Bridges, <clears throat> in particular cable stayed bridges, the cable stay, the cable that runs from the tower to the bridge deck, is traditionally steel. They're subject to uh, corrosion and um, durability issues. Composites are now used in the cable stays. Composite bridge decks, especially in remote areas, are to produce using composites today. Medical applications, uh, if, you, if a person loses a leg, they need a prosthetic, which is stiff yet lightweight. As shown here in the upper left, uh, there are a number of different composite prosthetics. Knee braces, either following an injury when you need to keep your knee or joint in traction, uh, or during a football game, if you're on a play for the Seahawks and you want to protect your knee, those sorts of things are all produced using advanced composites. Recreation. If there's any golfers here, you've all at one time or other either used or tried a, quote, composite golf club. The Ping uh, company this last year um, offered a new driver they call the Rapture. It features a combination of titanium and carbon epoxy head with a carbon epoxy shaft. Now I can tell you from my own experience, the ball still doesn't go straight, but uh, <laughs> if they're lighter at least. Fishing poles, skis and snowboards, tennis rackets, bicycle frames, these are all produced with aerospace grade graphite epoxy or carbon epoxies. Musical instruments, there are uh, uh, lots of different, uh, just, just about any stringed instrument today can be purchased based on uh, carbon fibers. I show a guitar here in the upper left. There's some imaginative violin makers today on the lower part of the screen. If you're too traditional to buy a composite violin, you might think about a composite bow in the lower right, which are more durable and last longer. Even, quote, brass instruments today <laughs> are being used or are being uh, accommodated with composites. There's a company called Canadian Brass, which is working with Wright-Patterson Air Force Base to uh, develop a tuba with a carbon epoxy horn. They're trying to develop a tuba which has the same sound, at least as good if not better sound projection and a lighter weight. And that's important if you're a member of the Husky Marching Band. <laughs> so in summary, 
Uh, there are UW faculty, staff, students, and alumni who have worked and contributed to virtually every technology that Al and I have talked about this evening. Uh, composites and their associated manufacturing techniques or processes are, are, are used in any, just about any industrial segment, uh, including, of course, aerospace. They're critically important in our future energy needs throughout the, uh, throughout the world. Lightweight, allows uh, efficient structures and a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. We need new manufacturing processes. Of course, new composites would be nice, but in addition, we need, even before that, we need new manufacturing processes for things like the auto industry. And again, I didn't talk about new composites. Let me just say that there are new ones with better properties on the way. Thank you very much for coming tonight.